This is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. I'm Dean Perrine, Vice President of New Media and Account Strategy at JSA, and I will be your moderator today. On behalf of our team here at JSA, welcome to our virtual roundtable series. Today's roundtable is brought to you by our video collaboration managed service provider, Pinnica. With their video platform, our panelists are able to stream in live video feeds from across the world. So thank you very much for that, Pinnica. And thank you to our viewers joining us live and joining us on demand after the, uh, after the program is done. Thank you very much. So let's go ahead and get started. Today's topic is telemedicine 2.0. Telemedicine is no longer a novelty with nearly three in five U.S. employers now providing cost savings digital to healthcare benefits to their employees. Big data and the Internet of Things are increasingly driving this surge. Big data has been a primary focus of change in the U.S. healthcare system and will drive even more change for individual patients and disrupt both the Internet of Things and the way physicians' day-to-day -day operations go. This virtual roundtable will examine the state of telemedicine 2.0 and how big data analytics and IoT are shaping its evolution. So let's go ahead and meet our expert panelists. With us today, we have Mr. Brian Eagle. Brian is a principal consultant at Vertex Consulting. And we have Mr. John Gardner. John is a partner, of Nokia, a partner at Nokia Growth Partners. Gentlemen, welcome to JSA TV. Yeah. Great to be here. So let's go ahead and get started. Brian, I'm going to kick this one off with you. Why don't you give our viewers a quick primer on telemedicine? How does it work? Um, why would physicians or healthcare professionals um, adopt a telemedicine strategy? Right. So I, I, I'm, I'm not a healthcare professional, obviously, so I'm going to talk about this from a telecom perspective, which is, which is my background. Um, and you know what what I've seen over the years with the development of this uh, this space is really that you're able to extend the healthcare um, and the services that doctors offer in a more centralized hospital or uh, or, or clinic environment out um, to a much broader audience, uh, and you're able to collect more information to make the data that they're getting back in around patients uh, more useful. So, you know, telemedicine at its core is just, you know, remotely reading or viewing or chatting with uh, a patient uh, and being able to, through telecommunications, extend the care offering um, from the doctor's office out to wherever the patient lives. But on, on a broader basis, um, it's opening up a lot of new areas, particularly um, in home health care, which are reducing the cost associated with delivering this service um, and improving outcomes. And, and really, those are the two things that you know, any new health care system should do, improve outcomes and reduce cost. Excellent, Brian. Thank you very much. John, what's your take? Well, I think that um, uh, you've got to be careful to um, think of things from a definitional framework. Um, telemedicine can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, the way uh, we have as investors, uh, you know, tried to break it down is, um, you know, there, there's one way of looking at it, which is um, more or less a glorified FaceTime replacement, um, sort of basic triage and or customer or patient care management platform, um, which, which may be more what you're referring to as uh, uh, telemedicine 1.0. Um, but then there's also uh, telemedicine is fully integrated into the practice management and patient management workflows. Um, and I think there's another concept, and this is, this is where maybe more of the uh, IoT big data um, uh, component comes in, uh, is uh, what I would call uh, virtual or remote care, uh, where you're really talking about, um, uh, depending on the environment, it's you know as if uh, the, the the patient and the doctor were in the same place, or there's some care regimen uh, for severely disabled, um, you know, aged things of that nature, where uh, you, you actually have uh, 
a, a virtual room or a virtual home connected to uh, some other institution on an ongoing basis. Excellent, John. Um, and you're actually providing some great segues for me. So we're going to stick with you uh, for this next question. You know, IoT integration and big data capture and analysis are seemingly leading the charge to telemedicine adoption. How are IoT and big data changing or fueling the advancement of, of telemedicine? Um, well, I, I think that uh, uh, one of the things uh, in this uh, e example, if you don't mind me just taking a, a short diversion, uh, the, the, um, the, the concept of stepping from glorified uh, FaceTime to something that is fully integrated into practice management is not insignificant. Uh, and uh, the example that I typically use is uh, uh, you know, uh, give give my my mobile number to to my family, my wife, my kids. Um, you know, work hard just like uh, most of the folks on the phone do. Um, uh, you know, ask them to in, in to to call me during the day on a you know as needed or sort of an emergency basis. Um, and and when you think of a a practice um, or an individual doctor managing hundreds or maybe even thousands of people, uh, just sort of turning on the capability. Uh, creates a, um, a, a, a whole host of downstream issues that need to be managed. Uh, and, and so um, th there, there is, uh, you know, one aspect is more of an enterprise software workflow management um, driver where, you know, we're seeing companies come up with some pretty innovative things to, you know, uh, do things from a scheduling management perspective. Uh, uh, and um, uh, 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 again, deeply integrate with uh, to be able to uh, not only connect a people, a person with a care provider, but then also immediately access healthcare re records and things of that nature. Um, that that those types of technologies um, are are really uh, making 2.0 a more practical uh, exercise beyond primary care or, or just uh, initial triage. Excellent. John, thank you very much. Um, Brian, your turn. IoT and big data changing the, uh, changing the way we do telemedicine. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what's, what's been happening in the telecommunications industry for, for years is that devices are getting smaller and the transport costs are getting lower. So, um, you know, in the, in the very early days, uh, being able to send data, um, particularly image data or any kind of uh, um, high bandwidth requirement data, um, was expensive to do. Well, that, that's starting to change um, significantly. Now, you know, lots of things can be monitored. Um, I think one of the, you know, the, the things that has propelled that um, back in the uh, early aughts was the proliferation of 2G uh, and how, how that really drove down the cost of um, that sort of telemetry data. Uh, so, you know, now, you know, blood pressure machines can be monitored. Uh, neonatal devices can be monitored. Um, this data can be collected. Uh, the data on your sleep apnea machine uh, can be collected and sent back to the doctor. So now, you know, what you're starting to do, um, and, and I'll tell you an example very personal to me, is my daughter, who's, who's type 1, um, has a, uh, a meter that's monitored. It's, you know, connected to her uh, cell phone, and the cell phone periodically sends data back to her doctor. So, you know, now you're able to see a lot of these devices starting to be connected back into um, either platforms that do the analytics um, or the hospital or uh, primary care physician uh, uh, offices where they're doing the diagnostics. And then, you know, on top of that, uh, what you're starting to take a look at is, you know, with cheaper storage and fast processing um, at, the, at the host or server level, uh, you're now able to start to grind a lot more of this data looking for patterns. So, you know, back to the example of, of diabetes, um, you know, there's, 
Um, it, you know, it's not an exact science. It varies by, by metabolic rate. It varies by, you know, lots of different things. So now you're able to start to get more personalized um, uh, recommendations on how, how much insulin you bolus, um, how often you do that, et cetera, depending upon what you eat. So you can now track what you eat, what your response to that is, um, and then how much insulin you should give, what your response to that is. And over time, you start to build a pattern um, that recognizes, you know, what you need to do when you eat certain foods, when you exercise, when you have certain levels of activity. All of this big data, um, you know, was really not possible 10 years ago. But today is very much a, an everyday occurrence for people you know, with, with diabetes or other chronic conditions uh, to be able to have that data go back somewhere where the analysis can take place and more personalized care can be delivered. Excellent, Brian. Thank you. And that was actually going to be a question for you, and, and that is, um, so when, do, when can we expect to see um, some of these, kind, these kinds of uh, telemedicine 2.0 um, data capture and analysis and, uh, used in, uh, in the real world? And I guess the answer to that is right now. Um, so very good. Thank you for that. But um, that also begs the question of security. Security is a very, very buzzy thing in our industry right now, as you guys know, um, and for good reason. But with telemedicine, we're going to be handling like, countless volumes of personal and sensitive information, medical records, et cetera, all, all the things that you were just talking about, um, Brian. But um, John, why don't you talk to us a little bit about um, the security issues around IoT and big data and, um, and how those issues are being dealt with? Well, uh, you know, in, in, in a lot of um, uh, conversations um, you know, on, a, on a framework, people can look at, at uh, technology adoption uh, from uh, aggressive adopters down to sort of tech laggards, tech leaders and tech laggards. And on, on most fronts, um, you know, unfortunately, healthcare has been a tech laggard. Uh, but I do think uh, that having been said on this specific air, uh, aspect of security um, and privacy, um, the, the intense focus on that as, as a mission critical requirement for uh, all the data systems as they are being built from the ground up um, actually gives healthcare an advantage on that factor. Um, so uh, I, I think that uh, uh, historically it has been uh, a significant, you know, compliance with HIPAA, um, making sure that uh, a person's holistic health care uh, history is accessible to, you know, in real time to the point of care um, in all instances uh, has been um, uh, a dream, uh, but been, been something that uh, has been very hard to execute on. Uh, the fact that it was the right objective um, and, and, and that a fundamental requirement of that objective was uh, an intense security platform, I think gives healthcare an advantage in this front. Uh, the, 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 the second one is I'll just, uh, uh, since, since you're you know, throwing out a buzzword, I'll respond with the buzzword. And, um, it, it, it may seem crazy, uh, but I do think that Bitcoin um, is something that actually may have very intriguing opportunities uh, within, within healthcare. Um, again, uh, giving control to the, the patient um, over the uh, healthcare record and, and a, a trail and understanding of who has been able to see it and not been able to see it and, and, and access and, and control over that, to, to me, um, is, is, is quite intriguing. And so that's not something that you'll see, um, you, you know, in the next two, three, maybe even five years, but longer term, uh, the convergence of those two buzzy uh, phenomena uh, uh, could be quite interesting. Very cool, very cool. Um, Brian, what's your, what's your thoughts? Well, again, from a telecom perspective, um, you know, any wireless signal that's sent can be hacked. And, you know, this is... Uh, uh, if, if you leave it open to people, um, somebody's going to try and hack it. Um, and, you, you know, I, uh, I, I'm really not sure how exciting someone's sleep apnea data may or may not be to uh, a hacker. 
but where you really start to get into from a wireless standpoint on, on security implications um, is when these devices control your life. Um, so there was a lot of buzz, um, uh, you know, when Dick Cheney got a, a, a pacemaker um, about, uh, you know, what level of security was the communication between the control device uh, and the pacemaker. And there was even uh, in the HBO series uh, um, Homeland, uh, you know, a, a bit of a, a, a spinoff on that where the bad guy, the terrorist, was uh, uh, able to... Uh, uh, to kill someone through manipulating his uh, uh, his pacemaker. So, you know, you, you do have to worry about those kinds of things. Um, but, uh, you know, most of the other sort of malicious hacking, um, you know, I, I think the guys uh, that are, are typically behind that are going to be less interested in, you know, again, your sleep apnea data, your your heart pressure data, uh, than they are going to be in some of the other um, healthcare records um, and, and how they can really uh, manipulate uh, some of the billing data if they're able to get into hospital systems. Because, you know, re remember, you know, the, the target hack came not in a direct hack into the system, but through, you know, one of their building management systems, one of their HVAC systems. So. You know, if you've got a lot of these new remote home health care systems feeding data into hospitals or, or clinics, um, and that becomes so, and you can figure out the path into those clinics, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's where I think the security uh, starts to become more of an issue because, the, you know, a, a lot of what's motivating those guys is money. So, you know, there's not a lot of money to be found in your sleep apnea data, but probably more so in being able to redirect billing. Now, I just have to take up on one point that John said. I absolutely agree. I mean, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or some of these other, um, you know, crypto uh, currency or, or secure contract um, uh, systems, uh, they're absolutely going to be a part of how you overlay on top of standards. Um, I actually just wrote a, a blog post about that uh, as it relates to, uh, to CAN bus and Modbus communication uh, in uh, heavy equipment. Uh, because, you know, any time you start to establish, you know, any standard like that, what you've done is you've given people a roadmap on how to hack it. So, um, you know, being able to use uh, these kinds of uh, secure contracting uh, technologies, uh, I think, uh, absolutely agree with John, I think that's the wave of the future in terms of being able to make more secure that type of personal data. Excellent. Thank you guys very much for that. Um, let's talk infrastructure. Uh, maintaining the uh, telemedicine infrastructure has posed, uh, is going to be a long-term challenge um, as the proliferation of devices, etc. cetera. Um, but how, how is that proliferation? easy for me to say, right? Prol proliferation of devices um, and kind of the, the taxing of that infrastructure ultimately advancing that infrastructure, or is it advancing? What are some of the things that we might expect to see out of our existing infrastructure that help us to um, plan for, for, the, for future devices and for uh, future uh, big data transport? And Brian, let's stick with you. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, as, as John alluded to earlier, um, uh, you know, healthcare environments haven't been um, fast to adopt some of these technologies. Uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, um, um, I, I know a company that's doing a great business uh, selling fax servers, uh, which is a fairly old and outdated technology, but you know, as HIPAA requires it, um, this is still the main method of moving a lot of data around uh, into hospitals and you know other healthcare agencies and systems. So you know, we we do have to upgrade um, some of our legal requirements in order to be able to move some of the you know the the, the storage and easier movement of data into you know, the 20th and 21st century here. Um, I think that's sort of step one. Um, again, speaking from a telecommunications perspective, 
um, you know, 2G and the proliferation of 2G and the you know, very low cost of 2G data offerings uh, helped to propel a lot of these systems. Um, and, you know, as, as we know, 2G has been shut down by AT&T and is being shut down by, uh, by others, uh, both domestically and, and globally, although on the slower track overseas than, than domestically. And so now it really gets down to, you know, will some of the replaced technologies, uh, because a, you know, a straight 4G connection to these devices is going to be more expensive than some of these uh, home healthcare systems are going to look to uh, to embrace. So, you know, the question now is, um, you know, will some of these next gen technologies, whether it's uh, CAT M or um, or narrowband IoT. Uh, be sufficient both in terms of, of bandwidth and low enough in terms of cost to be able to continue to um, propel that proliferation. I think they will be because it's um, it's a sizable market, and and uh, you know as as these are just now being introduced, uh, I think you're going to see people start to uh, uh, to adapt pricing and service offerings to meet the requirements of the marketplace, and we just haven't had enough time to be able to see that. So from a telecom in infrastructure standpoint, you know, some of these next generation uh, IoT uh, technologies that are coming out, I, I hope, um, are going to be able to embrace the, the, the requirements there uh, for some of these low-end systems. And, you know, I hope going forward that, uh, that the, the laws and regulations will catch up to the the technologies today, and we can move past the fax machine uh, and on to uh, more, you know, broader uh, technologies that can be more easily integrated into uh, the types of big data systems we've been talking about. Thank you, Brian. Um, John, infrastructure, telemedicine infrastructure. What uh, what changes can we expect to see? Let's just say over the next five to ten years. Well, it, it, the, the benefit of focusing on a tech laggard industry is that you can look at the, you know, what's going on with, with, with some of the folks on, on the other side of the continuum and, and, and try to postulate what, what aspects of that are uh, patterns that you should see to be replicated and maybe what aspect uh, wouldn't due to the unique natures of healthcare. Um, uh, at, at a very high level, um, yeah. Uh, you, you know, you have public cloud infrastructures working on top of Amazon AWS um, versus private cloud. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of unique issues with respect to, um, to, to healthcare that, that make the public cloud approach, um, you know, so, somewhat uh, challenging or, or uh, a little bit harder for healthcare systems to, to um, enthusiastically embrace the private cloud approach um, uh, uh, has its benefits, but then of, of course, it's also um, the, the more proprietary approach that um, in, an organization would take, the more expensive it is. And, and again, healthcare is, n is not an industry where uh, the, there are uh, super large IT budgets. Uh, it's not like financial services, for instance, which has really been driving uh, a lot of the stuff on the private cloud side, have very large IT budgets to work with uh, for, for more customized uh, solutions there. So, you know, I, I think that's um, one, one interesting part to, to see play out. Um, the other part that's uh, super important uh, is, is, is you look at other more traditional um, uh, enterprise uh, data infrastructures, uh, the API platforms is sort of a, a key component uh, of that. And uh, again, in most enterprise settings, you have more flexibility for open API or totally open API. Uh, the, the main primary objectives are more about efficiency um, and uh, not that uh, uh, control and privacy and security are not issues uh, with any organization, um, but you know, efficiency usually is, is the, the primary goal. Uh, that is inverted somewhat when you're talking about healthcare. Um, and, and so uh, what we're seeing uh, in the marketplace is um, th that healthcare organizations themselves are going to have to create some sort of uh, curated sandbox type onboarding um, approach uh, to connect uh, sensors, you know, so this mass proliferations of sensors to, that, that are available to collect data 
but also more frequently the services that are running um, uh, on, on top and that are, are looking to sell these as services, the, the connectivity with the sensors and sell that, or the connectivity with people and patients and then sell that into healthcare uh, regimens, uh, that it will end up having to be a, a, a much more highly curated approach to that than maybe what you would see, uh, you know, invite all comers, uh, more Salesforce platform kind of approach that you'd see in, in traditional enterprise. John, thank you very much. Um, okay, last question, guys, and John, we'll stick with you. Um, what is it about IoT and big data analytics that really excites you right now? We talked a little bit about what's happening right now, um, it, it, you know, on, on the street, but what is it that's going to happen that really gets you excited? Um, well, I, I think that uh, uh, what I'm really excited about in, in starting to see, you know, windows on the future, uh, the, 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 the mass proliferation of sensors, you know, and the connectivity of those sensors to the cloud is the sort of the core tenet and driver of the opportunity around IoT is exciting in and of itself. And we are seeing that today. The challenge that has remained is how do you make all that data actionable? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you pull insights out of that data uh, and, and, and actually get it in front of the people that need it in a time frame where uh, it's actually useful. Uh, and um, we're, we're seeing dramatic strides uh, forward on that. The second thing that's uh, very exciting um, is uh, uh, the, the concept that, you know, of, uh, you know, Internet of Things, uh, a, a lot of these, uh, and, and again, Brian referred to, you know, in individuals um, with uh, glucose meters, uh, heart heart rate meters, um, uh, uh, the uh, people that are uh, tracking in uh, diet. Uh, th there's a whole host of. Um, are, are you taking your pills? Uh, uh, all of these things um, are, are are wonderful from the perspective of capabilities, but at the end of the day, uh, still. Uh, a lot of times fall down from the fact that they require a significant amount of manual effort to actually uh, uh, maintain compliance and push the data uh, to the cloud. And um, that, that, that friction that's involved in the, the ongoing continuous manual effort uh, to, to make sure that the right data is getting to the right place uh, is, is actually a barrier to sort of what I would call mass adoption. And what I'm really excited about where I'm going with this observation is that we're increasingly seeing uh, new technologies uh, come to the scene which uh, create the, what I call ambient sensing uh, environment where data can be collected uh, and uh, machine learning and AI can be applied in ways that um, push the data, structure the data, um, uh, in, in a way uh, that um, uh, does not require this manual uh, interface in order to uh, make it use, so useful. And um, I, I think that that is the catalyst that's going to take the 2.0 of telemedicine today, IoT connectivity, and, and, and really create the 3.0 opportunity. Awesome. Thank you very much, John. And Brian, you have the last word. What excites you? As we talked about earlier, and as John mentioned, the automation of some of these therapies is going to be key. Um, you know, I can only speak to you know, the ones that, that I'm very familiar with, but, um, you know, I, I have a, a, a daughter that's uh, been a type 1 diabetic now for almost 20 years, um, and I've watched those technologies come from um, something that was very much um, a, you know, you took a shot every day and you sort of guessed what, uh, uh, what, what was required uh, to systems that are now doing more continuous monitoring. Um, and now you're able to see where you are uh, in that pattern. And now the next evolution of that, which is the stuff that we're just starting to see this year, are some of the big data implications coming in, which is, you know, how, how how does your body react when you do this, this, and this? Um, you know, you can probably do a pretty good job of saying, okay, well, I know if I eat a sandwich um, and it has bread and this and that, that I should bolus this. 
But, you know, if I was running around this morning and I ate this sandwich and I had, you know, this drink and I had coffee and I wasn't feeling well or whatever, then, you know, that's the sort of stuff. If you can start to collect that data and start to automate the responses to that, um, you know, that's when it becomes, um, uh, I think, uh, you know, very, very exciting because now, now you can, again, back to the two drivers that, uh, that all of these things um, should be focused on, which is, you know, improving outcomes and reducing costs because uh, otherwise, you know, what, why are we doing it? Um, if, if you can keep people in compliance um, through these automation tools, then, you know, you are going to improve outcomes. Um, and, you know, I, I think on a personal level, that's, uh, that's very meaningful. You know, if I look out into the, into the future and say, what is, you know, what are the things that, uh, you know, coming down the pike, um, you know, again, uh, the big data that's, uh, the big data analysis that's going around on individualized therapies for cancer is just absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, if we can, uh, you know, now having gone through, you know, sequencing DNA and collecting a lot of that uh, genetic profiling information, um, we can start to make much more individualized uh, therapies around cancer um, that were not possible before. You know, and, and, and I think, you know, 20, 25 years from now, um, we're going to be looking back at some of what we were doing early on with chemotherapy the same way that, you know, we, we look at leaching uh, as, a, as a healthcare technology from, you know, the, the 1700s and before. Uh, I think that's the sort of path that we're on um, and the sort of path that, uh, that this sort of uh, uh, big data analytics uh, are allowing us. So that's, that's my... Uh, glimpse into the future, personalized uh, uh, therapies, healthcare therapies, uh, driven off of um, a much broader uh, understanding of what actually makes us different from other people, so that those technologies and treatments can be uh, uh, can be more effective. Outstanding, Brian. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thank you as well, you guys. I feel like we could have. Um, we could have gone on another hour. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, but I, again, I want to thank you, uh, Brian Eagle, Principal at Vertex Consulting, and Mr. John Gardner, Partner at Nokia Growth Partners. For questions or to feature your C-level here next time, email, email us at pr at jsa.net. Thanks for tuning in to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom, and JSA Radio, your voice for Tech and Telecom on iHeartRadio. I am Dean Perrine. Thank you again for being with us today, and we will see you soon.